Before we start, we would like to send our most sincere condolences to the loved ones of Kimberly and Jamie Cates, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. This case takes us to Mont Vernon, a rural picturesque town in the state of New Hampshire that's named after the hometown of George Washington. With a population of less than 3,000 people, Mont Vernon is a close-knit and upscale community where crime rates are low, trust levels high, and people are comfortable leaving their doors unlocked at night. In 2009, 42-year-old Kimberly Cates, her husband David, and their 11-year-old daughter Jamie were enjoying life in leafy Mont Vernon after relocating from Baltimore five years prior. The Cates had been keen to experience life in a small town, and with its attractive rural setting, Mont Vernon was an ideal location. A caring and enthusiastic person who was dedicated to her job as a pediatric nurse, Kimberly had quickly settled into small town life. The Cates moved into a large ranch-style home two miles out of town. Four Trowel Road sat half a mile down a dirt road in a secluded area surrounded by woodland and one of only four houses on the street. The family loved the quiet tranquility of their new location, but David's job as an engineer for the DAE systems required him to travel up to 26 times a year, and the home's secluded position had given rise to some anxiety in Kimberly. The family installed an alarm system and motion sensors. Kimberly made a pact with a neighbor that they would keep an eye on each other's homes. By 2009, however, Concerns over security had somewhat dissipated. Nothing bad had ever happened in Mont Vernon. The town had not had a murder in over two generations. There was one in the house, yes. Is that something that you and your wife ever used? We used it for a very brief period of time, two or three years ago. Basically, there was a short in the system and we couldn't get it working. Was it working in October 2009? It was not. On Saturday, October the 3rd, 2009, David left for his business trip in Maryland, leaving Kimberly and Jamie alone in the house. Spending Saturdays together was nothing new for the mother-daughter duo and the pair often slept together in the master bedroom when David was away. Later that night, David messaged his wife to wish them good night. Kimberly messaged back saying they had plans to go to the mall the next day and maybe to the karate studio where Jamie could practice her new favorite sport. Those plans would never eventuate. At 4.15 a.m. that morning, Sergeant Kevin Furlong received a mutual aid request from the Milford County Dispatch regarding a suspected home invasion. The dispatcher had been unable to establish any clear details from the caller, who was quietly whimpering. The call had come from 4 Trow Road. Assuming that he was attending to a burglary or home invasion, Furlong dialed for backup. While he waited, he approached the house. Peering through the front windows, he caught sight of movement in the kitchen. A female child had lifted her head up from behind a kitchen counter. Her head was drenched in blood. I saw a, a young girl laying on the floor. Um, I observed that she was completely covered in blood from her head to her toe. Uh, I observed that she had major injuries and major trauma to include lacerations to her face, extremities, um, as well as I observed that part of her foot was, was missing. Sergeant Furlong says Jamie was trying to scream, but nothing was coming out of her mouth. I got close to her. Um, I told her that I was a police officer. I was there to help. Um, she then said in a whisper while shaping, shaking that she thought her mommy was dead. Furlong found Kimberly Cates' body in the bedroom. Milford police officer Eric Wales arrived soon after and tended to Jamie Cates outside the house. I asked her how this happened, and she said that there was a guy in the house. Uh, she said that there was guys in the house, and one of them had a knife, and the other one had a bat, and he hit my mom. At his hotel room in Maryland, David Cates woke to the harrowing news that his wife had been murdered in their home, and his severely maimed daughter was in the hospital. Eleven-year-old Jamie had suffered horrific injuries. 
Her head, arms, and torso had been hacked and slashed 18 times. Each blow delivered with such force that they caused a broken jaw, cracked skull, and a punctured lung. A portion of her foot was missing, and her big toe was almost completely severed. But Jamie had survived, and she was lucid enough to recount to police every terrifying detail of the previous night. Jamie said she had woken up in the early hours of the morning to see her mother sitting up in bed in the dark. She heard her mother ask, Jamie, is that you? Before her mother had started screaming, a man was repeatedly striking her mother with what looked like a baseball bat. Another man then attacked Jamie with a knife. Her mother had fought hard, begging the men and shielding Jamie with her body. But the blows kept coming. At one point, Jamie had jumped from the bed, but then had been thrown into a glass door where she had collapsed. Lying on the floor, she pretended to be dead. She heard the men say, get the jewelry. When she was sure they had finally left the house, she staggered into the kitchen and called 911. An autopsy revealed that Kimberly Cates had been struck in the head and torso 36 times with an object believed to be a machete. The blows were struck with such force they had broken her skull and sunk into her brain. And she had been alive throughout most of the ordeal. Was she alive for every single one of those wounds? Yes. Every single one she was alive for. The defense pointed to the fact that many, maybe even more of Kimberly Cates' injuries were caused by the knife allegedly used by Christopher Gribble. But Strausen clarified they both caused Cates' final injuries. Only the jury was shown graphic photographs of Kate's body. The other images were drawn diagrams showing injuries the medical examiner said no one could have survived. And she died as a result of all of these wounds causing bleeding. It is an unimaginably horrific and senseless attack. But by who? Jamie's account suggested that it may have been a burglary gone wrong. But nothing about the nature of the crime fit that of a robbery. Kimberly and her daughter had been attacked while sleeping in their beds. Only a handful of jewelry had been taken from the house. This was no robbery. No sooner had the investigation begun than police had received several leads. 22-year-old Jamie Hollins had been at a friend's house in the nearby town of Brookline, where two acquaintances had been talking about having just killed a woman and a child in a house in Mount Vernon while two other friends watched, he said. Several other teenagers came forward with similar claims, describing how the pair had paraded knives around and claimed it was just the start of their murderous rampage. The defendant got out of the car and we started talking. And what did the defendant say? Um, he was bouncing and jumping around between different con conversations. Um, but he had said that he had killed two people. He said he was bouncy? Yes. Could you explain what do you mean by that? He was very up is the best way I can describe it. Um, very happy, excited, an, an adrenaline rush. Those teenagers were 17-year-old Stephen Spader and 19-year-old Christopher Gribble. The two friends who had watched the attack, 18-year-old Billy Marks and 17-year-old Quinn Glover. On the afternoon of Monday, October 5th, state troopers John Encarnacio and Jeff Ardini pulled into the driveway of 7 Wallace Brook Road in Brookline, the family home of Stephen Spader. Outside of the house, they ran into Christopher Gribble and Stephen Spader, who were on their way out. Both agreed to be interviewed and were taken to the state police barracks. Marks and Glover were already at the station. None of them would be returning home. Christopher Gribble would be interrogated by Encarnacio and Trooper Jeff Ardini for more than seven hours. At the time of his detainment, Gribble was wearing camouflage gear and carrying four pocket knives. Once at the station, Gribble was upbeat and cooperative, telling police in long-winded detail about his strategic brilliance at Dungeons & Dragons. I have found an incredible ability for strategic and tactical thinking, he said. Gribble had learned about the attack in Mont Vernon on the news that day, he said, and had found the whole thing very disturbing. 
As it happened, he and Spader had been in the area the night of the murder. They had been driving around some back roads at random until the early hours of Sunday morning, stopping once in a little dirt pull-off with a tractor so they could go to the bathroom. Um, assuming that somebody specifically tried to kill him, like, that rubs against my conscience personally. I'm one of those type of gentlemen and chivalry sort of guys that you don't even hit girls that want to go out and treat them badly. And if the girl's in the hospital, obviously she probably got injured or something. It's, so, it's funny you should mention that because uh, I want to let you know she is going to survive. Fortunately, that's good. Yeah, that is real good because it, it's it's real good because she deserves to be alive. And so does yeah, so does the lady. I'm sure. You know? But you know what else is good? It's good because she could ID the two people that could be great. That'd be awesome. I hope you guys can do that. A search of Gribble's car had meanwhile uncovered a knife, rope, hatchet, garbage bags, shovel, and a receipt for $200 worth of jewelry from a pawn shop made out to Gribble. When confronted with the receipt, Gribble remained unperturbed. That Saturday, he and his friends had visited a yard sale, during which they had purchased $20 worth of jewelry and then sold it at a cash-for-gold kiosk, he said. Incarnacio now dialed up the heat. He told Gribble that his friends were in other rooms telling a very different story about the group's movements that weekend. The story is coming unraveled. Then take me away. I'm giving you the opportunity to tell us why this happened. I didn't do anything. I'm to someone is telling us right now that you told them to cut that little girl's throat. That would be a lie. Yes, that would be a lie. I don't want to I don't want to do that. That is Gribble accused Incarnacio of attempting to manipulate him, but as the damning evidence mounted, including details only the four culprits could have known, Gribble changed tactics. He began to talk, and once he started, he didn't stop. 19-year-old Christopher Gribble didn't exactly fit the stereotype of a killer. A devout Mormon and aspiring church missionary, the homeschooled Gribble had lived a sheltered life and never had so much as a parking ticket. Among his greatest accomplishments in life, he told people, was having earned the rank of Eagle Scout. Throughout his childhood, his father, Richard, and his wife, Tamara, had tried to teach their son right from wrong and had aimed to instill a set of values in him. But growing up, Christopher had his own unique challenges. He was not good with peers. He was awkward, laughed at the wrong things, and didn't pick up on the normal social cues most people take for granted, like boredom. He didn't talk much, but when he did, he would ramble on without pause. His father would later say that Christopher was intelligent and eloquent, but had trouble telling when someone wanted to stop talking to him. He also believed that whatever his point of view was, it was the right one, his father said. As a result, Christopher had trouble making friends. He grew up lonely and considered himself a social outcast. For this, he blamed his mother, who had chosen to homeschool him. It was definitely awkward. I, I mean, girls came and then they stopped coming. He seemed to be just so intense with them, and and he was always falling in love with someone, and and that made the girls really uncomfortable. Have you ever used the word socially dysfunctional when describing Chris? Yes. And the example you just gave would be an example of that. Correct. Later, Christopher would also claim that his mother abused him, but his accounts of the abuse were not always credible. His mother, he said, would pin him down and order him to remain silent while she popped acne on his back and pulled so-called infected hairs from his head with tweezers. From a young age, he had been forced to lug a vacuum cleaner around the house. 
His parents had not always believed his version of events that had taken place outside the home, and he had been spanked multiple times. Tamara Gribble would later admit to spanking Christopher as a child, once so hard that she had broken a spoon. But her loss of control had devastated her, and she kept the spoon in her bureau as a reminder of her regret. She denied Christopher's claims of abuse. But by his early teens, Christopher had begun to fantasize about killing his mother. The fantasies were elaborate and graphic, and, like his stories, slightly bizarre. All things like uh, cutting little pieces of her off, little bit by bit, out in the forest. Listening to her scream like I'd screamed. Telling her, hey, how's it feel now? Other fantasies included pouring boiling water over her, bending her limbs out of joint, and sprinkling her with sugar so the crows would come and pluck at her. He finally confessed his murderous fantasies to a counselor while on a cadet camp. Gribble's parents took him for a mental health evaluation. During his sessions, Gribble confessed to having concerns that he might one day become a serial rapist. Gribble's psychiatrist diagnosed him as displaying traits of antisocial personality disorder, but said he was still too young for a formal diagnosis. At some point along the line in Chris's um, seeing Dr. Talarico, he said, um, I need to talk with you about a number of issues that have come up during counseling. She said that there had been an issue of what she called inappropriate touching with somebody at church. And I said, what does that mean? She said, somebody touched him inappropriate. I said, did someone molest my child? And she said, no, it was just inappropriate touching. Somebody put their arm around him. I said, okay. And she said, and also you need to know he's made death threats against both of you. And we said, is it serious? And she said, no, I think it's just, you know, how teenagers say, oh, I wish you were dead, and he's blowing off steam, and he's not a danger to anyone. It's not a problem. Later, two women would complain that Gribble had groped them. Gribble would claim that he had run into the women accidentally. He was enraged when his parents refused to accept his version of the events. In 2009, 19-year-old Christopher Gribble was working as a handyman for his local Mormon church and making plans to become a church missionary when he reconnected with a boy he had met in Cub Scouts years earlier. Despite outward appearances, he and 17-year-old Stephen Spader discovered they still had plenty in common, like Gribble's car. 17-year-old Spader didn't have one and took to contacting Gribble for lifts to and from college and around town. Friends of Spader would later say that Gribble did anything that Spader asked. Spader introduced Gribble to his friends, a group of disaffected local teenagers, many of them delinquents or misfits. Spader's girlfriend was less than welcoming of Gribble when he arrived to the group, calling him Creepy Chris. But for Gribble, it was a profound moment, his first experience of a real friendship. Soon, he even had a girlfriend. Like Gribble, Spader had grown up with his share of challenges. Born to a mother with drug abuse issues, he had tested positive for cocaine and marijuana at birth. But at five days old, he had been adopted by a loving family, and the Spaders were devoted to providing him with a secure and loving home. As a child, Spader was personable and extroverted, playing with kids in the neighborhood and taking part in school musicals. But his mother, Christine Spader, noticed a change in Stephen during middle school. There was a wonderful boy who was our son, she said, who switched overnight to someone who was not controllable and who had major issues. Those issues were mood swings and violent outbursts. During a violent altercation with his parents, he had pointed a knife at his father. On another occasion, he had grabbed kitchen knives and began stabbing the kitchen counters and throwing food. Spader was also often anxious and medicated himself with prescription and recreational drugs. He shaved his head and gained a reputation at school for violence. No one wanted to mess with him, a former student at his school said. 
Spader's parents took him to see counselors and doctors. A psychiatrist diagnosed him with traits of borderline and antisocial personality disorder. Hoping to give him a fresh start, his parents remortgaged their home in order to pay for him to attend a more supportive and exclusive private school. Spader dropped out. By mid-2009, Spader had been arrested for possession of drugs and had begun openly divulging to his friends his growing preoccupation with robbery, torture, and murder. He had taken on the persona of a gangster, people said, someone violent and menacing, and he had a powerful hold over the friends he had chosen to surround himself with. Sorry, Mr. Glover, can you again go over some of the things that the defendant was talking about he wanted to do? Breaking into houses. And he, he talked about eating people, roasting people, putting heads on stakes, making scenes for the press. Did he ever use the term sleeping over? He did, sir. And what did you take that to mean, sleeping over people's houses? Staying over the night with the bodies, making a scene, doing things like eating. Did he talk about breaking into homes just to kill people? No. What else did he want to do when he broke into homes? Take valuables, money, jewelry, anything to make money. In the late summer of 2009, Spader announced to his friends that he was formulating a brotherhood or criminal syndicate of which he would be the president. The club would be called the Disciples of Destruction. And Spader nominated his first recruits as Gribble, 18-year-old William Marks, and 17-year-old Quinn Glover. The purpose of the club was to make money. Spader drew up a mission statement containing a detailed list of goals and bylaws. Loyalty and brotherhood were key. So was violence. His new members would need to commit a home invasion in order to join. Should anyone be present in the home at the time, they would have to kill them, he said. The three new recruits agreed. Later, Marx and Glover would claim they never intended to commit murder, only to burgle the property. Gribble, however, was enthusiastic. His new girlfriend, Ashley Martin, had just broken up with him. He was angry and disillusioned. As for what happened next, let's let the perpetrators explain. Because by the evening of October 5th, all four had confessed to their roles in the horrific attack on Jamie and Kimberly Cates. It was Gribble who talked the most. Now that he'd come clean, he appeared to be almost excited by the opportunity to share the dramatic details of that night. What's more, for once, he had something to say that people actually wanted to hear, and not just any people, important people, police. So it didn't really matter at that point. I was like, hmm, if they give me the death penalty, then I'll just be dead and this all will be over with anyone. Be like, uh, be like killing myself. At that point, I was kind of like, you know what, John, why don't you get your tape recorder? And uh, he came back and he was all excited tape recorder back in and that's when I told them exactly what happened pretty much the same way I told you here uh, I mean he asked a bunch of questions about it sp specific details he wanted to go back over and uh, just pretty much laid out everything about Gribble told officers that a few days before the murder Spader and Billy Marks had driven around looking for the right home to burglarize they found the perfect house, a large ranch-style home with a tractor in the driveway in an isolated spot in the heavily wooded Trowel Road. Spader then said, we are about to do the most evil thing this town has ever seen. Warning, what you are about to hear is Gribble's graphic account of the events of October 3rd as told to state troopers Encarnacio and Ardenafor. When Stephen opened the master bedroom door quietly, he looked in and he said that there are people, but we finally said, there's no people. Mm -hmm. So he started to get a little bit relaxed and started talking, he started to quite quiet us down. Then he shined the light on the bed and that's when we woke up. Okay. Um, then mother said something like, Jamie, is that you? Stephen threw the light. He went around to the inside of the bed. Where the girl kind of was sleeping. Mm -hmm. I started to circle around to the other side in case something happened. Um, there was 
they they stayed by the door. The mom sat up in the bed, started asking who was there, what was going on. And when she did that, Steve started hacking at the bed with a machete. Okay. Um, they started screaming for her to save them. Um, I don't know who missed them mostly. But I heard her hit the mom. Um, so I dove in and stabbed her a few times in the chest. Probably two or three. After the chase, but she started gurgling. Steve was just hacking away. He totally lost it. I was controlled for everything that I didn't really feel much of anything. I thought I would, but I didn't. I didn't know. And then uh, they stayed by the door. They didn't do anything. The girl jumped off. Steve was hacking away, and she jumped right into my arms. I stabbed her once, towards the, the face, and mm -hmm. I hit bone. And I thought the next was off. I didn't go on. Then I went for the front. I stabbed her. She went on the front of my chest over. I tried to twist her around so I could get a better shot of her heart. It was, it was automatic. I stabbed her a couple times in the back as I was swinging around. Um, she got free of the thing and flung her into the glass door, locked her head, stopped crying completely. The mom was still gurgling and kind of breathing deeply. Steve just, she went at it. I was actually kind of scared of it. He just, just kept hacking at it. The mom was obviously not very good. Um, the girl I was pretty sure wasn't going with her. She was completely out there for all of her parts. There's at least one slash across the mother's face down from the top right to the bottom right. Where I could see where it dented her skull and the machete in her eyes. Didn't love her. Steve had to a couple more times after that. And Steve couldn't go, but she was still pretty. So I went over and stabbed her inside of her. And then she went over and she went over and blood out. Not a lot of female, so I think she was probably gone. I think it was too stabbing Steve going over. Mark's claim to have stood in the doorway watching as the murder unfolded, while Quinn stood behind the door, covering his ears to block out the screams. Neither Mark's or Quinn made any attempt to call for help or to stop Spader and Gribble. While both mother and daughter lay bleeding to death in the room, the four teens searched the house, including the master bedroom, for valuables. The killers then drove to the home of 20-year-old Autumn Savoy. Savoy had already agreed to provide them with an alibi. He now came up with the idea of dumping the evidence into the Nashua River. Gribble said he had expected to feel bad after the killing, but instead he felt a huge weight lifted off his shoulders. All four killers were arrested later that day. Spader and Gribble were charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder for the attack on 11-year-old Jamie. Marks and Glover were charged with burglary, conspiracy to commit burglary, and armed robbery. Spader was the first to go on trial. As a minor, his court documents relating to his life and arrest were unavailable to the public. Spader was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Later, when the United States Supreme Court banned life sentences for minors, Spader declined the opportunity to appeal for a reduction in sentence, describing himself as the most sick and twisted person you'll ever meet. Both Marx and Glover had taken plea deals to get them to testify against Spader and Gribble. Marx was sentenced to 30 to 60 years, Glover sentenced to 20 to 40 years. Gribble was the last to face the jury and would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. During his three-day testimony, Gribble rambled at length, often contradicting himself. He remained calm, even upbeat, frequently sparring with the prosecutors. No, no idea. If I go to regular prison, okay, it's another way of living. I'll adapt eventually. I think it would be preferable and good for me to get some sort of psychological help. You're saying you're legally insane? I'm saying it's my defense, yes. You don't believe in your defense? I do believe in my defense. So you're saying you're legally insane? Yes. Strelson zeroed in on what has been on the mind of many during his trial. Could he get out? And if he did, would he kill again? Possibility is one of those sort of million to one sort of things. But I know it's possible. And if I did get out, I think it is possible that I could kill him. Jurors rejected Gribble's insanity defense. Dr. Albert Drachtinus, a psychiatrist for the state, 
said Gribble did not suffer from delusions or an inability to control his behavior, but was calculating, manipulative, and a liar. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Neuropsychologist Kent Keel evaluated Gribble after the murder and felt his callous facade during the interrogation was a persona he had adopted. In reality, he said he was someone with a fragile sense of self who made the decision to be a psychopath and that it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Spader, with his disturbed criminality, had probably influenced the suggestible and immature Gribble, he said who admired and emulated Spader. Whatever the dynamic, their actions that night left a family broken and a community traumatized. A longtime resident of Mont Vernon said that the murders had ripped at the heart and soul of a sweet little New England town. David Cates described the devastating loss of the woman who had been his soulmate and the best friend to his daughter, Jamie. It was full of energy, excitement, Precious smile and vibrant personality were so inviting to all. It welcomed you. You wanted to be with her, be part of her. Everyone who came to know Kim adored her. Whether they were fellow hospital employees, the townspeople, the guys who worked on her car at the garage, or just the people in the supermarket, everyone smiled at Kim's energy and kindness. She gave so much to everyone she met, you just couldn't help but smile back or help Kim. Kim was a mother, she and Jamie were inseparable. It was more than the usual mother-daughter bond. They were like one. Kim was a warm, affectionate mom who deeply enjoyed spending time with her daughter, and Jamie deeply enjoyed spending time with her daughter. Kim loved Jamie. As for Jamie, she grew up without the mother she loved. But if there is one silver lining to this story, it is hers. I am studying public health. Um, we are on the home stretch, just about to graduate. I have an internship left. Um, yeah, we are playing field hockey at UNCW. That's fun. I just started that up again. Um, yeah, just living every day like it's the last, right? 21-year-old Jamie Cates is an independent, open-hearted college senior, sharing pictures of her dog Brighton, laughing with friends. An amazing young woman who, at the age of 11, was left for dead. Her mother, Kimberly, murdered. The two attacked with knives and a machete in their Mont Vernon home. The lesson I learned from this 11-year-old girl who had gone through a terrible thing it can either hold you back or it can drive you forward. Ten years to the day, the tight-knit community at Amherst Country Club, the ninth annual Kimberly Cates Memorial Golf Tournament, celebrating Kim's legacy, a woman whose happiness and enthusiasm live on in her daughter.